Um, so we're really delighted that Ken has joined us tonight. Ken Rutherford has a BSc and MSc in Geology from the University of London, has worked as a geologist in the oil industry for over 40 years. As a resident in Braunton since 2009, Ken has gained a keen appreciation of the natural landscape and wildlife of North Devon. And Ken is also the chair of the North Devon Environmental Trust, which manages the Braunton Countryside Centre. And I hope he won't be too embarrassed for me saying that he's really been instrumental in helping to regenerate the Countryside Centre, especially with all the work that we had done here. So Ken, I will hand over to you. Nicola, thank you very much for those kind words um, in your presentation there. Uh, yes, the title of this presentation, which I hope you can see on your screens, is Why the Geology Makes North Devon So Special. Now that phrase, uh, rock sprawl, it really refers to the fact that the Earth itself is a dynamic planet with continuous processes and movements which occur not only within the core, but also have an effect on the surface of the Earth. These are processes and the subsequent erosion from the forces of the sea and the weather are reflected in the surface landscape that we see today, such as the picture in front of you. Now, consequently, the character of the rocks in any one region and those geological processes that have affected them, extremely influential in the lives of people who inhabit that area. And it affects them in many ways more ways perhaps than we actually think even to the extent they might even predict the weather but more of that later so the locations of communities and villages towns and cities are controlled by the geology and the geology of north devon is no exception it's created a special environment that's appreciated not only by us local people even though i've lived here only 11 years i regard myself as local but also by the vast numbers of visitors to the area, which greatly helps the economy of the region. Okay, so let's examine what's so special about our region. Now, firstly, we're gonna look at the age and types of rocks that are found in North Devon, and then the tectonic events that have altered them, and those erosional processes that have continually shaped them into the landscape we see today. So, We, right, I'm just about to change my slide and it's not working. Um, right. I'm having to change my slide, sorry about this. So. Okay, let's just see if we can get it changed from here. There we go. Right, excuse me. Okay, we have to look first of all at the geological map of the whole of Southwest England. And what we have here is a distinction between the north of, the, of this peninsula, which is mainly Devon and North Devon, and the south, which is mainly Cornwall and a bit of uh, South Devon there is a distinct change. Although the ages of the rocks are predominantly Devonian and Carboniferous, ranging from over 400 million years to about 360 million years, they're the dominant outcrops that you see. There is a distinction because down in the south, there has been these granite intrusions, which are in fact, all part of one gigantic granite batholith deep down in the crust. So that's where Dartmoor and Bodmin Moor and those other granites that you see right down to Land's End. We don't have granites up in North Devon except for Lundy Island, which is a granite that was intruded during the Eocene period, somewhat later than these ones down in the south. What we have here in this in North Devon and, and Central Devon here, 
particularly if we look, first of all, around the area between Bude and Oakhampton and up to the Tor Estuary, that light coloured area, that is the Carboniferous. Now the Carboniferous in Devon is called the Culm, C-U-L-M, Culm measures. The name Culm comes actually from a local term for some uh, very soft, sooty coal that was found in, um, in these measures and that had some ec economic use. And so they've adapted the name for this area, but it's of Carboniferous age. And it is um, from 360 to 300 million years in age. But if we go to the far north of North Devon, north of the Tor River system, you can see the estuary there, then we have the older rocks, which are Devonian, the Devonian age. And they actually get older as you go northwards to the north coast. And we're going to take a closer look at that in due course. But let's just take a snapshot then of what life was like during the Devonian. Now, this is the sort of uh, reconstruction that we made of time during the middle of the Devonian times. And there, were a, there was a mountain range right on the north edge of North Devon, covering Bristol Channel, going into Wales. These mountains were about 10,000 foot high, but they were actively eroding and producing alluvial plains running south into shallow seas and down into a deep sea environment, which is where Exeter and Plymouth are located today. Now, this is during the Devonian. These rocks were eroded down into a flat layer. And on top of that would be subsequent deposition coming in from the mountains further to the north. Um, and they would be forming the carbonates, uh, uh, the carbonaceous, the, the carboniferous uh, rocks. So let's take a closer look at North Devon itself. And the area, as I mentioned before, the Colm area, the Colm measures, the, the Carboniferous, is this um, lighter coloured vertical hatched um, area south of the, of, of the Tor estuary. There's the old uh, ancient railway line there, because this map goes way back to the 1960s. But what we have is basically an east-west trend. And we see that in the Devonian outcrops there. And we run from the youngest to the oldest as we run up to the north of rocks within the Devonian period. They all have local names given because they've been first described and identified in local areas. And we're going to have a look at that uh, in a minute. But the interesting thing about the Devonian is that it is also a host of minerals. Mineral excavation has happened uh, in North Devon. This is because of the very old rocks with the fractures that have opened up, allowed fluids to go through, cooked up at various thermal levels, and result there is different grades of mineralization. Not as significant as down in the south, adjacent to the granites, where the heat temperatures were so much greater, but at the same time, there was enough mineralization going on to attract man into the area, way back into ancient times. And this is a location of mines that have uh, uh, occurred, mainly uh, in this area of North Devon. I've highlighted in color the various types of ore that were located in these various mines, some of them more um, economic than others. Others sometimes were just trial uh, mines to attempt to see how much was there and maybe didn't last very long. Others were certainly older and much more extensive, such as the Brendan Hills iron mines in the eastern area of North Devon, Somerset area. So we have other minerals as well, but iron ore of various types, including the siderite version, have uh, existed uh, in some of these mines. 
Uh, there's also been manganese, uh, copper, so you see it highlighted in green, uh, lead uh, was uh, very common. And of course, the name lead is, is also connected with the name load. And you'll hear about loads, which is really the old name for lead. Also, there's some manganese, but actually, and I'm sure may, some of you who are not familiar may be wondering, is there gold in them with their heralds? Well, yes, there is. Only little traces of it, but there are. Um, in the, uh, this area here, this, there's a mine called Britannia Mine, um, and um, that had traces of gold. So it's an interesting area, but it did attract man into the area uh, to excavate and look for these, uh, these minerals. So let's look at the stratigraphy. And in the stratigraphy here, it's mainly dominated, as I said before, the Devonian and Carboniferous. And so we have a succession. And in the Devonian, there's predominantly beds of uh, sandstone and mudstones, in some cases, shales which have been cooked up into slates, thinly bedded. And the sandstones particularly though, would be the most dominant with um, certainly uh, big sheets that we will see uh, existing uh, and identified um, as big slabs on the coastline around North Devon. I've also put in red there a list of the minerals and uses that these units have produced, which indicates how useful these rocks are, not only for the minerals I mentioned earlier on the map before, but also the significance of so many suitable rocks for building stone. Building stone, not just for roads, but also for houses, and also for uh, all the, um, the, uh, the borders that we see around the fields. And so we go into the Carboniferous and we range there from, again, local names, Biddeford Formation, Bude Formation, um, the Crackington Formations particularly are of interest, <coughs> and we'll see an example <coughs> of that at Heartland. And it's in the Crackington Formation that they had this unit, um, which is the, um, the, the mineral black, which is this um, very sooty, uh, coal that um, has been uh, recovered for economic reasons in various places and gave the name to Colm, the Colm measures for this range of carboniferous rocks. But that's the Crackerton formation as we know it locally here. And so it goes up through the, to the carboniferous and we get into about 300 million years ago. And there was a, a major um, event there. It's called the Variscan orogeny, which then subsequently uplifted and folded all these um, uh, older rocks. And after that, there wasn't much more. There was a little bit of the Permian towards the east of uh, the Devon uh, area. And then there's no tertiary or Mesozoic at all, apart from that, that granite that I pointed out that intruded for Lund and formed Lundy Island. Subsequently, very recent uh, deposits from the Quaternary and the Holocene. And here we have a series of um, glacial and interglacial episodes that uh, did have some impact on the area. And as a result, glacial clays deposited, which have given rise to an economic use in terms of pottery clay and brick clay. And also some of the gravels formed in the alluvial plains uh, have been also excavated in past time. So as we see, there are economic uses for these units of Devonian Carboniferous and more recent. Okay, but now I want to highlight something and that's this orogeny. The Variscan orogeny is extremely important 
to what happened in North Denmark. And we're just going to look at that in a little bit more detail, because this was a major event that went right through Europe into Southwest England and across into Ireland. And an orogeny is basically a term for mountain building, whereby the crustal plates are pushing against each other, one perhaps overriding the other. Huge forces created from below. And as a result, when these move together and clash, what you get is a, a, a crumpling and pushing up of the overlying sedimentary layers to form the mountain chains. And we see this all around the world at various times in history. And more recent examples, of course, would be the Alpine uh, at the Alps um, or the Himalayas or some of the, um, the Alps in South Island, New Zealand. These are more recent ones. Or the Andes. These are all created by crustal plates moving together and pushing up sediments. And this is what happened at the end of the Carboniferous. And if there's one thing um, we need to remember, uh, it, it's, this, uh, it's this event. So let's have a look at it as a cross section. Now, this is a cross section running across southwest England from the south, from Cornwall up north across the Bristol Channel into South Wales. And what we have is a, basically a huge crustal sheet pushing northwards. And it's basically slipping along a detachment zone and thrusting up against this, this plate that forms the northern part of Wales and, and North England. As a result, there are numerous faulting episodes that occur with it as a pressure release. But this event, this thrusting, the impact it has on the surface of the layers of sedimentary rocks that had been laid down already, the Carboniferous here and the Devonian here. This is North Devon. This is what's happening in our area in North Devon. Basically, a crumple zone where the rocks are pushed up, folded, faulted, and ramped up. And the harder, the softer rocks fold more easily, particularly where there's shales. The harder rocks, the thick sandstones, get ramped up into rafts, pushing up vertically. And this is all a pressure release from this, these huge forces. That's what's happening. That is the Variscan, the Variscan orogeny, and the way it affected North Devon. Well, let's look at it on the ground. An example of that, of what we see, are these tilted rocks pushed up during this orogeny. This is a picture that uh, courtesy of uh, Paul Madgett, and this is taken at Saunton. And here in the foreground, we see near vertical beds of Devonian and Carboniferous. They're just on the boundary in terms of age. And these are, uh, shales and, and, and sandstones cooked up very hard, tilted, and there's a series of beds, but they're all pushed up like a bunch of books on end. In the background, you see the, the cliffs of Saunton, and there we have horizontal beds, which are actually a raised beach of much more recent age. So let's take a closer look. This is in a similar locality at Saunton, and you get a better impression now of the junction between and the age difference of Devonian Carboniferous rocks of 350 million years against an overlaid by a layer, a flat layer of beach sand, a beach rock, and it's only 120,000 years. So you can imagine the uh, the, the difference, that time difference, that, that period of time when these rocks, the Devonian Carboniferous, have been pushed up by the Variscan into mountains, subsequently eroded flat over millions of years, and eventually we've seen an overlay of more very recent rocks. 
OK, so let's see what happened with the Vriskan further south in the Carboniferous rocks of the Colm area. Now we're going to go to Heartland and just look at what happens there. What fantastic structures we have here. This is a site that is visited a lot by geologists, just to look at what the sheer forces of pressure created by this orogeny have, have done. Look at the tight folds that we have. They're pushed so tight together that they've been fractured along the apex. And there's a combination here of shales and sandstones and some limestones. But they're soft enough to be pushed together rather than ramped up, but so tightly that they fracture too along the top. And you can see fractures uh, straight up vertical there. So really, you've got to think, we've looked at the tectonics here, and if, if there's one thing that you should really take away from this talk, it's that one term and that's that one word, if you want to talk about North Devon and why it is as it is. And that is the Variscan. So there we have it. We've looked at the geology and the rocks, the nature of the rocks and the ages. We've looked at the tectonics that affected them at the end of the Carboniferous. Now I said that there's going to be a long period of erosion and weathering and changes that have made to help shape that landscape. And that's what we're going to look at now. Of course, I said there's no tertiary, there's no Mesozoic, there's basically no tertiary um, overlying this area. But what we do have is very recent uh, material from the Pleistocene and the Holocene. And we have the glacial periods and they have helped shape the landscape a bit as well and done certain things, which you will see. And so let's have a look at, for example, the ice sheets. Now this would be an extent of the ice sheets coming down. And we're looking here at 450,000 million, 450,000 years ago. And this, this is the Anglian uh, episode. And here this ice sheets come right down. And in fact, it seems to be paralleling the coastline but in fact, there are places where it has intruded into the land. And particularly, we know that has occurred in the Tor estuary. There's evidence of glacial deposits within the Tor. For example, there are glacial clays that have been found at Fremington. And there, of course, that clay has been utilized for pottery. It's also clear that uh, there have been the glacial um, material dropped into onto the coast and into the bays. We see an example of that with what we call glacial erratics. Now erratics are rocks that are not in situ, don't come from the immediate area. They've come down carried by the ice sheets and brought it into the land on the on the coast and then as the ice retreats they're dropped. And so they're completely alien to the lo locality. An example here, you see it says 50 tonner. And uh, courtesy of Paul, this uh, photo, it highlights the significant power of glacial sheets, ice sheets, to be able to bring such things. This is estimated to be 50 tons. Now, Paul took this a few years ago in the summertime, courtesy of the Quinn family that were there for scale. We're very grateful to them. And um, look at the roundedness of that boulder. That shows that it's been dropped down and subsequently weathered by sea action. And you can't really see much on the fabric of the rock there. It's a summertime shot. You, you don't, it's not obvious, oh, is that exotic? Is that, where's that come from? Is that an ig igneous rock? Uh, it's not clear. It's covered with, with lichen as well. So I put another photo in that shows what that rock looks like in the winter time, because then it's clear of the lichen and probably wet as well. And look at the difference there. Courtesy of Peter Keane's book, I'll talk about that later. He's there for scale. 
that rock there, you can now see the dramatic character, the fabric of the rock. It's actually an igneous rock that has been highly metamorphosed. It's turned into basically an igneous gneiss. Um, and um, that is a type of rock that has been heavily altered. It's probably very, very old and a lot older than Devonian. And it's come down from Scotland. And uh, that's, there, there are numerous other erratics as evidence in the bays around North Devon. Here's another one. And this is known as the red granite. So that last picture was at Croy, at Baggy. This one is at Saunton. And this is uh, known as a granite, a red, the, the red granite, a glacial erratic. Now, this was brought down again with the Anglian um, ice sheet and 450,000 years dropped here and then buried subsequently by the, the, the beach sands here, this raised beach. Uh, it's only because of sea action that it's been actually exposed now. Uh, so we can have a good look at it. There it is. Stained with iron, iron ore, um, iron content, but it is a granite. And look at the rounded nature of it as well. So it's been dropped and then subsequently weathered by the sea. But you see, we also have evidence that these ice sheets didn't just come round to adjacent to the coast and drop these erratics and then retreat. These ice sheets also, we have evidence for, have come over the land itself. They've ramped up over the land. And we have an example here. This is courtesy of uh, Roe Manjit, and this is a, a, an erratic that was dropped by the ice sheet on top of Baggy, so much higher up. So we can see that these ice sheets perhaps had more influence on the landscape than perhaps has previously been thought. Now, this is an epidiorite, and it was found in the field by a farmer who's moved it to the edge of the field, but it hasn't come from down on the beach. As you can see, it's jagged. It, it's, it's not rounded as you would expect if it had been dropped by the sheet, the ice sheet on, 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 on the beach and then weathered by the sea. This has always been up there on top. So we can see that there's been evidence of uh, activity by the ice in helping to shape the landscape. We see that in certain parts of North Devon. And we're going to go up to the north coast now and have a look at the Valley of the Rocks. Now here we're on the north coast and as I pointed out before we're dealing with some of the oldest rocks that we have in North Devon because they're the oldest part of the Devon succession, the Devonian succession. And here on the coast you still have that regional tilt, which is up to the north and down to the south, caused by the Variscum. And you can see that on the back slopes, that's probably the, 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 the tilt of the rocks, the beds of rock. But the Valley of the Rocks is very distinctive because of, first of all, the character of the rocks. You have these rocks that are very coarse sandstones uh, with gritty sandstones, uh, like the hangman grits. And the very tops of these, features here are, um, they're grits, they're very coarse sandstones, which are known as fallen grits. And they give this very characteristic shape to the top of the edge of uh, these, these, um, this ridge here, very distinctive. But what also I want to show you is the shape of this valley. Now, this is a dry valley but clearly there's been some movement of water down here. And also the shape of this valley does make you think that has there been an ice sheet through here? And that's certainly what uh, some geologists think. Let's just step back a bit and have a look at it from the distance. Now you can see the shape of that valley in there. And as we come further back here, it looks like there's a passage through here of, of, of a river system and also perhaps some ice. 
It's just conjecture, but it's um, it fits the bill possibly. Also, this happens to be probably one of the most picturesque cricket pitches in the entire country, as a beautiful place to visit on a nice summer's day. This is what Jolly just think is going on. That uh, the East Lynn River at one time ran parallel with the coast and through the Valley of the Rocks and out by Lee. And also may have been accompanied by an ice sheet at one time as well to enhance the character of the valley. And then there's been a, a more recent times when the river has diverted across into out at Lynmouth uh, for a variety of reasons. As it cut down more into the valley, it found a better line of gravity induced out to, to, to the beach there. There may have been silting up uh, as well as it was going further west. So there's, there's a variety of reasons, but that is the common feeling that this is the line of the East Lynn River. Okay, so we see here the Valley of the Rocks and the way the, the edge of, of, the, of the coastline there was acting as a, a buttress for, uh, against the sea because of the tilt of the rocks. And if we go further west to Ilfracoon, take a look at these uh, problem features here. Now, Capstone Hill is a classic example of the tilted Devonian rocks that we see. Particularly when you walk round the edge of Capstone, you get to see the bedding and how it's inclined down uh, into um, the town itself. And that is a backslope that you're seeing there, the green field um, showing the, the actual uh, dip of, of the beds of one of the Devonian uh, formations. Lantern Hill has a similar uh, effect as well, a St. Nicholas Church on top. And possibly when you go you know, across uh, beyond up to the Tours and look at Seven Hills, you'll see that the tilt of these rocks create a sort of barrier to the sea. But the interesting thing is, as we saw, there was a valley with a river system going through the Valley of the Rocks at one time possibly enhanced by some ice. It makes you think though, that if there was a river system running down into the Ilfracoon behind the back of these tilted prominent, prominent features and had the good fortune to be able to breach and through to the sea to create a natural harbor. And this would be the line of, of, that we'd probably see or possibly a river system. But what it's done is enabled the breaching into the sea through the rocks, possibly created and enhanced by fracturing or faulting. But it's created a natural harbour because there aren't many natural harbours along this coastline. And as a result, we see a place like Ilfracoon forming there because fishing would have been one of the main activities. Right, so if we look, and just to, to see this tilt of the rocks, if we're in the Ilfracoom and we're looking due east to Hillsborough, you can now get a view of what these rocks are like tilted this way. And these are some of the oldest rocks you see, Linton Beds and Hangman Grits. Um, they're very hard, the oldest Devonian in the area, and you can see how it acts almost like a, a barrier to the sea, like a sea defense. And in fact, that's the tilt angle of those rocks. So if we look at that tilt angle, and it's fairly regional, and work our way around the coast, and so instead of facing due north, we start to face towards the west, northwest. Then we come to places like Rockham Bay. Now, now you start to see how these tilted rocks are coming out and they're going into the sea in a different way because we're dealing with long lines of slabs of rock running into the sea. 
So the, there are no natural harbors around here. And in fact, this is a kind of coastline which was extremely hazardous to shipping in the old days. What I also want to point out on this uh, photo here, this landscape, is look at this valley. A very smooth, nice valley. And look how it abruptly ends. This is basically a hanging valley. And there's quite a few of these around this coastline. It's emphasizing that the erosion of the coastline, even though these are hard rocks, has been so aggressive that the sea has worked its way into the valley itself and truncated it. It can create very nice waterfalls, and we'll see that further south. And to emphasize how destructive the sea is, Rock and Bay is a, a classic example. This is a more recent times when the storms have destroyed a part of the National Trust steps down into the bay. Now, I'm not, not actually sure whether it's been repaired yet, but this is quite dramatic. And it's created a situation whereby they're going to have a real problem repairing that. Because not only do you have the storms to worry about, it exacerbates landslips as well, as we see uh, here in the foreground. OK, so thinking of that regional tilt of those rocks, we work our way around the coastline and we come to Mort Ho. And here, again, you're seeing even more exaggerated the impact of those slabs of rock sticking up in the air, very, very steep tilt and running into the sea. And very dramatic, not good for shipping, but wonderful for walking. And if we work our way right round Mort Ho and come to Mort Point, then we really see the way these tilted rocks give, give us a landscape. Now, this is dramatic. This is right on the top of the, the, the tilted rocks, just as they're running out to sea. And these are the Mort Slates, still Devonian, but slightly different nature, originally shales that have been cooked up into, into almost slaty appearance. And they're very thinly bedded, hence it gives you this really alien character. And it certainly is a wonderful place to visit. Favorite of a lot of us here who live here, but also for the tourists as well that come. And if we carry on around the coast, we get to Baggy, and here we see the slabs of rock. These are the Baggy sandstones, and they're such extensive slabs that they create something which is created maybe of economic use to this area, and as much it creates and encourages visitors to come for rock climbing. If you look carefully, right at the very top, if you can see my cursor, there's actually a couple of gentlemen there, a couple of climbers, right on the top of the edge of this um, climb, and they're contemplating what route to take. Actually, there's about a dozen different routes mapped out on the, this slab. Very popular indeed. The other interesting thing about Baggy Point is that um, because of the inclination of these slabs and the way they're running into the sea, that the sea sometimes is able to erode through some of the weaker slabs and got into the interior of the land into the form, uh, forming a cave system. There's, there's this ex extensive cave system under Baggy, apparently. Uh, and uh, may well have been harboring smugglers in the old days. And so another occupation that man may have had around this area. Uh, we won't talk about the wrecking either. Okay. So, and of course, climbers uh, do um, are common around here. I did get a shot of some others at the end of the day on another slab around the other side there. And there's uh, uh, four climbers just finish at the end of the day, uh, their climb, come up from the bottom there and they're all done and ready to go home. Yeah, it's certainly a lovely area for, for this sort of thing. 
And um, also the tilt of these rocks creates another activity that we do see uh, now uh, in this area. And that's coast steering. You can see the tilt of those rocks, great for leaping off into the water there. Coast steering business, well, where we're allowed to, they'll be running it again. And uh, it certainly has uh, created a big interest in more recent times. It's amazing, really. People actually pay to do this. Okay, going back to these rocks now, the tilt of the rocks and the way they're folded, the fact they create features um, on the coast here. Uh, one of them, obviously, is the fact that they create rock pools. Now, rock pools are really great fun for visitors uh, to, to, to investigate the, uh, the sea life. And, um, and you see them adjacent to the beaches at Croyd and Saunton and elsewhere. And uh, there are, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to see and investigate what creatures they are. And uh, they often are subjects of talks uh, uh, as well. And uh, some of our favorites are other uh, anemones, for example, like the snake blocks anemone that you can see in these rock pools. Or the beadlet, that's a nice one there. Or if you're very lucky, you might see the very, very elusive Glaucus pimplet. And uh, so there we have it. So those are very interesting um, features that you can see in the rock pools. But take another look at these rocks. Now imagine the situation if the, the, this is in the tidal zones we just looked at where the rock pools are, but when it runs into the sea, those rocks and crevices are still there on the seabed below the tide, the tidal level. And there are sea creatures that just love that. They just love those rocks, those crevices. Around baggy, crabs. Lots and lots of crabs. This is a photo taken when Libby and I were snorkeling around baggy um, a few years ago. And we just saw loads of crabs everywhere. And they love the crevices. There are crab pots there that the fishermen lay down. And we had a look in those absolutely crammed full of these crabs. Okay, let's look down further south into Heartland again, going back to those folded uh, rocks that we see um, at, uh, at Heartland. And uh, this coastline here uh, has, uh, like we saw further north, has uh, been peneplained a bit in, and, and affected by the sea to create a series of truncated valleys. And uh, so working our way around, there's a nice uh, folded piece of rock there at Heartland as well, They're not just tightly fold, fold, folded, but some gentle, more gentle folds. But you will get these slabs up against the valleys and creating truncated valleys. And this, of course, gives you spectacular waterfalls. Uh, this is Speaks Mill very dramatic, um, a wonderful place to visit. It's just to the south of Heartland, not far to walk in the southwest path. And looking back now, you see it comes through the valley there and pours over that slab of, uh, of rock. And this is in the Carboniferous. This is Carboniferous aged, Crackington formation. As a matter of interest, just take a look at the back there. And you see that valley behind? You see the shape of it? So that makes you suspicious. Oh, has there been ice around here? Has there been an ice sheet that's flowed through there? Makes you think. But Speaks Mill waterfall is so dramatic and it's caused by this slab of rock that's pushed up. Because they're pushed up into these vertical positions as we saw at Heartland, it will take the opportunity where possible to truncate a valley and create a waterfall. Another example is this one here, just further along. There's another waterfall coming down. And you can see the tilt of the rocks here. Uh, but look at the fact that it's coming down, it's hitting a, a, a ledge there of another uh, bed of rock. And then it lands on the back of this big slab of rock here and runs down the, the back of this slab and down into the sea. Very spectacular. If we go further inland, due east from this heartland area where we see this type folded, we do see a feature that perhaps is allied to this. And that's Codden Hill. 
Colton Hill is a series of whalebacks, whaleback hills in a long, thin, lenticular line running mainly east-west uh, within the Carboniferous. I'll just point out where it is on the geological map. If we look at the area between Barnstable and South Bolton, just between the two, but just below the boundary of the Carboniferous rocks and that um, grey-blue crosshatch there of the Pilton beds, then it's running along there, just on the edge. And it's obviously not far from the Heartland area due west, roughly on the same line. Well, we need to look at it in a bit more detail. So let's have a look at a geological map. Now, this is a British Geological Survey map. This is stuff that's mapped in very great detail many years ago. And what we have here is that yellow colored feature running east-west, that's Codden Hill. And it's crossed by lots of faults. But what we want to know is, is it similar to what's going on at Heartland? Is this folded? How do we know? Well, the geologists are able to identify the different strike of these rocks when they find a bit of in situ uh, outcrop. And certainly, if you look below the sea in Codden Hill, you'll see a symbol there. Now, that symbol shows you the strike of the bed. Imagine it is a flat bed and which way it's, it's tilted upwards and aligned. But then which way is it tilting? It's dipping to the south. See that little tick there? That indicates that we have a south dipping rock here on the south limb of this cotton hill. And there's a, a value there, so it says 75. Well, that's 75 degrees a dip. And if you go further to the east there, you see another feature. This time the strike is east-west, the dip is still to the south, and it says 80. Okay, so the south limb of this is dipping to the south. What's happening on the north limb? Well, it fits because here, there's a feature here, which is running a strike again, uh, almost east-west, but the dip is to the north in a value of 65 degrees. And this is right close to Bishop's Taunton, just to orientate yourself. And uh, this is the Tor River running north-south that transects it, but then it cuts across and swings round to the west there, and Barnstable's up here in the top left-hand corner, just to orientate yourself. Now, what this is, is a feature, a Carboniferous uh, aged um, rock that's comprised of chert. It's quite hard. Now, chert is um, a, uh, a siliceous rock, and it gets it's harder than the adjoining uh, um, other rocks of the Carboniferous. And so there's been differential erosion and it's allowed this feature to stay very prominent running east-west. Very spectacular, very interesting to visit. So what we see really is we're getting to now talk about um, erosional features which um, have affected uh, the more mature landscape uh, that we have existing in North Devon. And so with all this erosion going on in the highlands, eventually it's going to come down in the form of river systems and end at the sea in an estuary, which usually broadens out and forms an alluvial plain or a floodplain. Now we're standing here on the, in the foreground here on the East Hill with Braunton village just in front of us. And we're standing on Devonian rocks and we're looking across the estuary to the Carboniferous rocks of, of the Colm, the Colm measures. And we have the Tor running from left to right, from, from uh, east to west, and the Torridge coming in from the south into this estuary. Now, being a mature floodplain, uh, we have some interesting features. One of them is quite unique, and that's here uh, on the right-hand side here, the Great Field. 
rich alluvial soils were deposited and has created one of the few places where you can have arable farming. Because on the highlands, on the, on the hills around us, on both sides of the estuary, the rocks themselves uh, don't produce very good soils. Good grassland, which is suitable for grazing. A lot of dairy cattle down in, uh, on, on the, in the south uh, and uh, dairy grazing and sheep um, and other cattle uh, on the Devonian rocks uh, in the north here. So there's very few places where you can actually have arable farming. The Great Field was one of them and was well preserved, as we'll see. But because it's adjacent to the coast here, we do have marshes, Broughton Marsh, uh, where there is grazing because the marsh was drained in the 18th century. And this area is protected by the, bur the Broughton Burrows, one of the largest dune systems in the country. We're going to have a look at that in a minute. But what I want to focus on right in the middle here is Halsey Island. Now, Halsey Island was a, a, a marsh that was drained and used for grazing. We had an excellent talk on Horsey Island by Martin Batt uh, in this series that demonstrated what's happened to Horsey Island and the wonderful wildlife we're seeing now, particularly bird life. But what has happened here, and as you can see in the picture, it's full of water now. It has been breached. The sea has got in there and is transforming it. And we'll see that later. But we're going to focus on Broughton Burrows. Now, Broughton Burrows are huge dunes. They're quite mature now. They have been supplied with sand, whipped in off, off the beaches, off Salton Beach, by predominantly westerly winds for many, many, many years and developed into these dunes. This, the original um, material would have come down from the eroding highlands of the granites of of um, Dartmoor, uh, also from, uh, from the Exmoor area, eroding Devonian rocks that had a lot of quartz in sandstone. And also that beach rock I showed you earlier is also eroding and providing sand as well. So there's a sand supply of, from various uh, sources and it's developed these dunes and they've become quite mature there's a high water table with lots of uh, ponds and therefore has a fantastic plethora of wildlife and flora. And we had two great talks on Broughton Burrows by Mary Breeds and John Breeds. John, of course, was a ranger here for many years. And Mary, of course, has written a book on the flora of Broughton Burrows. So cattle are kept there now. Um, they, they help to keep some of the, the um, vegetation down, enhancing the habitat for the wildflowers. Lots of interesting, rare wildflowers around. I won't go into detail. Mary did so, such a good job, but you've got lots of orchids there. And one of my favourites is the bee orchid uh, that we see as well. And there's a view from the edge of Broughton Burrows across the Salton Beach the supplier of a lot of the sand for these burrows. But in the distance, you can also see uh, the Salton Ridge, the cliff there. And that's the old raised beach that we saw earlier. And that also as, as, is supplying sand as it gets eroded. So the Great Field, as I said, this is one of the few places where you can have arable farming in North Devon. And this has been one of the, this is one of only two well-preserved, complete medieval great fields in the country, and you can still see the strip farming nature of this area that is still held by different families farming different parts of this field, and this is very interesting because. The medieval farmers realized how valuable 
this the soil was in this area. So they didn't build any of the farmhouses on it. They all lived in the village of Broughton. Basically, Broughton was a collection of town farms where the farmers lived. And you can still see those uh, farmhouses today. They're all residences in the older streets of Broughton, in South Street, North Street and East Street. And some of them still have their thatched roofs. Also adjacent to the great field um, are the marshes. These are drained marshes, as we can see, and very picturesque. Lovely area to cycle round and to visit. And there's interesting wildlife here as well. It's one place where we've seen kingfishers several times. But I wanted to talk also about Horsey Island, only in as much of the destructive nature of of the sea, because this is a great illustration. Horsey was only breached two or three years ago, and yet the impact has been dramatic. Here you can see what was left of, of, of a grazing field, and everything else is gone. This was a perfectly good uh, house, but that's now been destroyed. And basically, it's going back to nature in as much that this eventually is turning into a salt marsh. The blessing is that it's going to be a fantastic wildlife haven, particularly for birds, as we saw with Martin's talk. So we can see that um, our story has traveled from 400 million years ago to the present time. Through the geological record, we've peeled away the layers of human activity. We've seen the oldest rocks in the area, the Devonian, provide iron ore and other minerals for mining activities. The ancient tectonic movements have created the hilly terrain that's suitable for grazing sheep and cattle, but also created the safe harbours for Ilfaku and Biddeford and Appledore, where they, they host the, the fishing industry. And so as the population grew, there was a demand though for building stone from the rocks and the houses and the roads and for the glacial clays that were used for bricks and pottery. And now the sheer natural beauty of the area has created the biggest activity of all, tourism. So we can see in conclusion that the rocks dominate our lives in numerous ways. Where we live, how we make a living, our leisure activities, they can create landscape views too, that excite or even calm the spirit. North Devon has all of that. So what's the answer to the title of this talk? Why North Devon is so special? Well, remember folks, it's the Vriska Neurogeny. So, love the scenery, thank the Vriska. Don't like the hordes of tourists, blame the Vriska. And finally, I, I did mention at the beginning of the, of the presentation that they might even be able, rocks that is, to be able to forecast the weather. And here's the evidence. And folks, uh, on that enlightening note, I will conclude the talk. Thank you. And that's not North Devon. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. That was such an interesting talk. Do you want to stop sharing your screen, if that's OK? Yep. And then we'll go over to questions. Brilliant. Just change my view here so I can see everybody. So, oh, it is just so fascinating to think about all these ancient forces that have been at work that impact our lives now and uh, ancient peoples and the natural environment. Um, so I'll open it up for questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, if you could use the raised hand icon and you could find that on the more button, which is the button with the three little dots on it, if you can see that on your screen, or if you're not sure where that is, if you physically wave at me and I'll unmute you so you can ask a question. Um, but I'll, I'll go first, Ken, if that's OK. Yeah, okay. um, so you did mention there was uh, quite a few different resources that you referred to. 
Um, if people want to find out further, uh, where would you suggest that they could uh, look or any certain publications that they yeah, might want to have you, a look at? You can go online and, and there's, there's um, and, and to look at various uh, organisations that have reports on North Devon. One that I referred to was Peter Keane's excellent book on North Devon coast, uh, Classic Lands, Landforms, and that's the Geographical Association. That's this one here. Um, and uh, that's, that's a very good book. Um, and um, it's got some nice pictures and also it goes through the area and that, um, and also had that uh, stratigraphic chart that uh, I used courtesy of his book. That's Peter Key. The other one you can get is one that's by um, Devon County Council. And that, well, maybe it's not sure where we can get it or not. Uh, anymore, but that's the one actually we had used to have in the centre. That one there, that is Devon Geology in Devon, and that was uh, the, the visit Devon.co.uk. So that, that website may still have a, a geology book like that. The other one, of course, is Devon's Geology and Introduction. That's Robert Hesketh, and that one's uh, that's very good too. If you're really, really into the geology, then you can go into this tome here, which is the British Regional Geology, Southwest England. Uh, and that's the Natural Environmental Research Council, Institute of Ge Geological Sciences. So you can go, you can get this one uh, online as well. And that's, that's um, pretty good and very, very detailed. Um, there's even more detailed one here, which is the geology of the country around Ilfracombe and Barnstable. Uh, and that is real serious reading that is there. Um, and um, that's, uh, that's guaranteed that will send you to sleep. But it, it has got lots of detail in. It's got map references, very, very detailed. You can really, you can really nitpick away in your locality with that. What I also like, though, is that map I showed you. That's this one here. Now, this one is the Barnstable England and Wales Sheet 293 solid and drift edition and that covers Barnstable um, area um, up to Exmoor Forest and, th and that that's that's quite um, detailed for a map if you like maps or for those of you who are interested in geology anyway you may already have access to the 10 mile map that covers the south of England which is this one here uh, all these you can get online at various sources look at some um, um, and just just google and you should be able to get the information that you need but there's, there's other information, all sorts of uh, books that are available um, if you want to broaden out on the subject, particularly to do with mineralization um, and the economic geology of the area uh, and such like. That's brilliant. Thank you, Ken. And I must say, thank you for digesting all of that. So and uh, putting it into a format where um, us lay people can understand. I'm sure many people will agree with that. Um, well, we've got some questions in the chat. Um, so Paula has asked, can you tell us about the gravels and flints on the shore? Yeah, uh, that's not something I'm that uh, 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 familiar with, but obviously you will have a combination of material that has actually been dropped by the ice sheets. Um, and we looked at that huge boulder um, that there's going to be other material that perhaps has been dropped and come down and been eroded and just formed the pebbles on the beach. And you know it's not come from the local stone. Um, and you can get um, other material that's come out of the, the rocks themselves, such as the, 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 um, the Devonian, the grits. Um, they have a certain characteristic of coarse material, sharp material that um, you'll end up on the beach. Um, the gravels, they've come down um, and deposited from the river, by the river systems into the estuaries. And of course, we know that uh, those gravels were excavated around Crow Point at one time. And so it was quite clear there was going to be a serious problem and they're affecting the, the, the coastline. And um, unfortunately, it was stopped, but uh, it could have caused a lot of problems because uh, we know that kind of disaster happened down in South Devon with hall sands. Um, down at Torcross, whereby they excavated the gravel and, and the, uh, out of the, the bay there. And as a result, the sea got right up to the coast and destroyed the village of Hall Sounds. So we know this isn't a good thing. 
So uh, that that's as, as far as I know about it. I mean, we do have other experts around us here. I know the magistrates can probably tell you a lot more about what's going on with the gravels than, than I can. <laughs> Thank you, Ken, for that. Um, Grant was asking, he said, did you misread your notes on Ilfracombe? Is uh, Hillsborough is Ilfracombe beds? Did you say uh, no, what I said was, uh, uh, I, I was referring to the, the different beds that you get exposed um, on that coast there. Um, and um, they are the Linton, looking at the, um, my map, um, I forgot what I said now. The, um, they are the Linton beds. Um, and um, you do have, they, they are the Devonian ones, but um, I haven't looked at the rocks to identify them myself. Um, but, um, yeah. So, well, we can come back to that one. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what the, Hillsborough is just the name of the hill. The hill there. Um, I did talk about the, um, the 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 we the, the may well be the hangman grits uh, located there. I'm not sure if that's what's actually on Hillsborough, but it is it is Devonian, whatever it is. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Sally's asked an interesting question. Why is Barricane Beach the only shell beach? Do you know the answer to that one? <laughs> no, uh, no, I don't. Uh, uh, um, I do not know, apart from the fact that um, you get a, um, a sifting through of different sizes of material at different times and in different settings. For example, you will see on beaches at any one time a line on, of, of, uh, on the tidal line deposited a whole line of similar sized um, shells or, or organisms that all seem to come in. And it's partly to do with their size and shape. They're carried with the same current. There must be something going on at Barricane that, that creates this consistent flow of such items into Barricane. But apart from that, I don't know. I'm sure somebody else does. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Um, okay, and uh, um, a question from uh, Grant. Sorry, so just um, just wait a moment. Um, what was the sea level uh, when the raised beaches of Thornton were formed? Uh, the um, those those that, that raised beach about one hundred twenty thousand years. Oh, sorry, the sea level, how, how big, how much it was. Yeah, so I um, guess the, um, the sea would have been a, a lot higher, wouldn't it? Yeah, it, it certainly was a lot higher. Um, and um, I'm not sure the exact amount. I know um, Paul Magic could probably tell you the exact uh, 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 amount, but um, it would be, um, I have seen 40 meters, but I don't know whether that was there. There have been, um, it's probably not as high, but um, you can measure it because you look to the top of that unit um, you've got some idea of relative to the current sea level what it is. So um, I, I can't say for sure. I've not measured it, and yeah. um, I haven't noticed um, the actual uh, uh, exact uh, depth. I don't. I don't want to put Paul on the spot, but I, I can see him. Paul. Uh, yeah, I just unmuted. I kept trying to use this uh, map. Um, a mat here. It keeps on kicking me out. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, I don't think I'd uh, want to get, get deeply into the discussion now, but yeah, I could answer one or two of the points. I think the thing is, wait until I'm able to do a talk. I've been booked for doing one in Easter 2022 for the Wildlife Trust, and I'm due to do one for the uh, for you, of course, but I, I don't think I dare do Zoom. I'll keep <laughs> we'll, we'll look forward to when you can do it in person, definitely. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Um, and then uh, Julian's uh, question here. Um, so cause of the dry valley of the East Lynn extension in Valley of the Rocks, um, as well as the tilted coastal rocks causing this, I understand that the southern extension of the youth age glaciers also stopped the East Lynn getting into the sea directly. Is this true? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Now, um, I have read something um, for sure. There are it, still theories but uh, that would be an obvious answer that the ice sheet did prevent it from there and hence that's why it ran parallel with the coast. No, that's a good point and I think it's quite valid. Yeah, 
thank you for that question. Um, has anyone got a, a question they'd like to ask? Oh, Paula's waving her hands at me. Paula, do you want to unmute? Um, I didn't like to ask. I thought everybody else would. But you haven't mentioned fossils. And that no. is such an obvious area of interest. And there's so few here. What do you know about them? Well, um, I can certainly tell you a whole list of fossils that have been identified. But um, um, in, in this book, that, that, that's full of fossils. Personally, the only fossils I've seen relative to this area were actually in Barnstable Museum. <laughs> but there is there is a bed uh, that is fossiliferous um, at um, Baggy, um, and it's a thin it's a thin bed, and um, it's down by the beach, and uh, I've been down to see it, and there's some brachiopods and other things there. Um, I think that uh, we found that uh, it's not a good idea to try and excavate there. Some people have done, and they've gone right into the rock, um, and that shale has been uh, cut uh, cut away not only by the sea, but also by people hacking away at it. I don't think it's a good idea, it's best to leave it alone. <clears throat> so there is, there is, um, there are fossils in all these uh, units. You have to, you have to try very hard to find them. There are localities. Uh, they are listed in the geological survey books. Um, and, uh, but I've never investigated the fossils here at all yet. Uh, I'm more a Jurassic fossil man. Ammonites are my favourite, but uh, certainly it would be a, a, a source for future investigation. Um, Grant mentioned he's seen crinoids at Down End, Thornton. Yeah. yeah that, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. Oh, and, and Mary said as well, yeah, about that. So that's really interesting. Um, so uh, John asked the question, um, can you tell him about the soft clays at Croyd Beach? The soft clays at Croy Beach, um, I honestly don't know much about them at all, whether they are um, indigenous to uh, the area um, in terms of um, related to um, a softer shale, perhaps, but the clays may be deposited um, at another time. Again, I would, um, I would give way to Paul if Paul has a view on that. He would be the man that would know. Okay. Um, I don't know if Paul's there at all. Um, Linda asked a question about the Carboniferous layers, the more recent in time. Where did they come from? River deposits? And if so, from where? Uh, well, now, uh, are you talking about carbonaceous layers? Not The Carboniferous would be the actual age of that, that unit that ranges in age from 300 to 360 million years and down um, and, and the Colman formation. But do you mean carbonaceous? The carbonaceous layers that you find in more recent times. Now they, they, um, it, it isn't the car the carbonaceous layer in the carboniferous. To get our terms right here, is this comb, and as I said, it's a black, uh, sooty um, coal, um, and that is of carboniferous age, and you do find it in certain places around. Um, south of the, the, the estuary, and uh, it was actually um, excavated mined for, for use, it's carbon black. Um, and and uh, that, um, but that does come from, and, and so it, it can be also that you have some glacial material which has also weathered and, and formed, not carbon black, but uh, things like ochre, um, and that has been uh, excavated uh, to use as pigments. Thank you, Ken, for that. Um, and uh, Paul just mentioned as well, please don't go hammering the rocks because it's a triple SI. So that's a good point. So thank you for that, Paul. OK, so if there's um, no further questions, I can't see anybody else. We'll draw the evening to a close. Um, so uh, just a, a note to say next week's talk is um, the reschedule one with a military historian, Richard Bass, who's going to be talking about the role of Braunton um, and, and the role of Braunton played in World War II. So I hope you can join us for that. If you did have a ticket for that before, um, as you know, we had to postpone that. So you will automatically get the link for that sent to you next week if you've already got a ticket for that. 
Um, so thank you all for coming and thank you all for your contributions and donations as well. So as you know, it really helps during this time. Um, and finally, I'd like to say a big thank you to Ken for his interesting talk. I, I know he's he spent a lot of time and effort putting it together and it was it was really fascinating. So thank you very much. So please, can you all join me in giving him the thumbs up or the virtual rounds of applause? Thank you, Ken.